Good afternoon. Uh, I am Ruth Katz, Executive Director of the Health Medicine Society Program here at the Aspen Institute, and we're delighted to have all of you here. Thanks so much for joining us at the inaugural event of a new policy briefing series here at the Aspen Institute, Cancer Research in the 21st Century. Now, as I look around this room, I think it's safe to say that almost everyone here has been touched by cancer in one way or another. So I suspect we all agree that finding effective treatments and someday perhaps even a cure is the scientific quest of our age. By showcasing the advances that have been made in cancer care and previewing what lies ahead, this series will help mark our place on that journey. You'll hear today from two of the nation's most knowledgeable cancer experts who will talk about the research progress that we have made and the barriers we still face. This kind of convening is actually in the DNA of the Health Medicine Society program in bringing together thought leaders, innovators, and decision makers across disciplines. We create safe spaces to exchange knowledge and insights, to explore pressing biomedical and health policy issues, and ultimately, to build better health for all. We are delighted to be partnering with Friends of Cancer Research. Friends emphasizes scientific, regulatory and legislative collaborations as the best way to get cancer treatments to patients as quickly and as safely as possible. Two initiatives in particular highlight the recent impact of their efforts. The breakthrough therapy designation is an FDA pathway to rapid approval when a drug seems to demonstrate a substantial improvement over existing treatment. Working with partners in advocacy, regulation, and drug development Friends helped to make this designation, helped to move this designation from innovative concept to federal law in just 13 months. Friends is also the powerhouse behind a clinical trial known as LungMap, which was launched in June. Again, its ability to work across sectors was vital as it convened stakeholders in industry, government, and academia to design an efficient research protocol. In the, lung, in the lung study, more than 200 cancer-related genes are being screened for alterations, with patients then assigned to different new therapies based on these findings. That kind of personalized approach is clearly the future of treatment, and Friends is in the forefront of helping to drive it. Now, I want to give a special shout out to Ellen Siegel, the founder and chair of Friends of Cancer Research. Dr. Siegel holds a long list of leadership positions in cancer advocacy and public policy. But even more important than her stellar CV is the depth of her commitment to promoting research that will transform lives. As we launch this series together, her dedication has been evident at every step. And Ellen, we thank you. And you're going to be hearing from Ellen briefly at the conclusion of today's program. And she will be joined by the president of Friends, Marlene Malik, also a very good friend of the Aspen Institute. For now, it is my great honor to turn the podium over to Susan Page, the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today, who will be moderating this event. You have her biography in the background material we sent you and is also on the uh, seats, all of your seats, and no doubt have read her political reporting or seen her on CNN's Sunday Morning Roundtable. Grateful, Susan, that you have been able to take the time from your many journalistic pursuits to be with us today, and we thank you as well as the members of our panel. And thank you all for being here. Susan? Ruth, thank you so much, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. It's a great privilege to be here to moderate a panel with two such remarkable pioneers in the field of cancer research. And I'm so glad we've got a, not only a full house here at the Aspen Institute, but that C-SPAN is here so that, the, the, that we'll have an audience that goes well beyond uh, these walls today. Let me just very briefly introduce our two panelists, Dr. Francis Collins. Director of the National Institutes of Health, the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. He is renowned for his leadership of the International Human Genome Project. Among many awards, he's received the National Medal of Science and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Ronald DePino, President of the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, where he leads groundbreaking research into the molecular underpinnings of cancer. He was also the founding director of the Belfer Institute for Applied Cancer Science at Dana-Farber. He's received many honors and awards himself and founded several biopharmaceutical companies focused on cancer therapies and diagnostics. Thanks so much for being here today. Great to be here, Susan. 
So I'm going to pose some questions myself, and then later we're going to open the floor to questions from you all. So keep that in mind if things occur to you. We're going to answer the question, how close are we to curing cancer? But I thought we would start not by looking forward, but by looking a little back. Dr. Collins, you received your medical degree in 1977. That's right. This was six years after President Nixon had declared a war on cancer. So tell us what the assumptions were then about <clears throat> curing cancer, addressing cancer, treating cancer. Did you assume that cancer would be uh, cured by 2014, or what was your expectation? Well, I remember when I was a medical student at the University of North Carolina, there really wasn't a specialty at my school when I started there uh, in cancer. It happened during my four years where a special unit focused on oncology uh, was developed and somebody was hired to run it. And as a medical student and then as an intern and a resident, it was a scary place uh, because it seemed as if what we had to offer for most of the patients uh, who came into that particular part of the hospital uh, were very toxic, uh, poisonous substances, and that many of these individuals who had various types of solid tumors uh, responded quite poorly. It certainly did not seem to me at that point, as somebody who was really interested in how to bring together science and medicine, that they'd gotten together very clearly in this space. It may be hard to imagine, but at that point, the underlying <coughs> model that we now take for granted, that cancer is a disease of the genome, had not really been appreciated. We had Boveri going back to uh, the early part of the 20th century suggesting there's something about the chromosomes uh, that's involved here. But seeing that emerge as a actionable, um, unifying approach to this disease that would lead us in the direction of what we now embrace as this remarkable revolution in targeted therapies, that would have been really impossible for myself or anyone around me to have imagined happening during our lifetime. So it has been a breathtaking ride. But I think when the war on cancer was, was initially declared in the early 70s, we didn't have the tools, we didn't have the insights, we didn't understand the mechanisms uh, to be able to move at the pace we now can. But it was still a good thing to do that, to draw attention to this as a problem that needed a solution. And it affected so many people, and the answers were going to have to come out of research. And as Mary Lasker says, if you think research is expensive, try disease. Uh, and in this case, cancer was taking far too many lives, and we needed an approach. So even though it took many years of sort of struggle to try to figure out, well, what should the approach be? It was a good thing to get that ball rolling in a significant way. And now, as I'm sure we're going to talk about in the course of this afternoon, uh, we see the potential uh, of really tackling many different types of cancers uh, with a rational strategy uh, that has great hope for curing this disease. Now, you said, are we going to cure cancer? Let's right up front say cancer is not one disease. I think almost everybody in this room knows that. Cancer is hundreds of different diseases. We've already cured some of them. Uh, but there's a lot more we haven't, and they're not all going to fall by the wayside at one stroke of one o'clock on a Thursday afternoon where somebody goes, oh, we've got the answer. It's going to be a hard-fought battle step by step, and every cancer is going to have a different series of steps before we get there. We obviously want to talk uh, much more about what steps those might be, but first, Dr. Pino, you received your medical degree a few years later in 1981, mm -hmm. and I wondered if you could talk about how attitudes have, mm -hmm. as an oncologist, how attitudes have changed by patients and their families, a diagnosis of cancer. How different is it now from what you saw when you were getting your medical training back then? Well, certainly back then, uh, cancer strikes fear uh, into the hearts of patients and brings despair to families. Uh, patients that were uh, subjected to treatments back then, you know, were underwent disfiguring surgeries uh, with little reconstructive uh, capabilities at that point. Uh, the chemotherapy was pretty harsh. Uh, and even back then, as a result of those advances, which really occurred in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, we had, uh, you know, a significant reduction in cancer mortality with about half of patients um, losing their lives to cancer. Uh, now it's about two-thirds of patients that survive their encounter with cancer. And a lot of that is driven by uh, not just the treatment advances that we'll be talking about, but also the preventive strategies that we understand a lot more about the instigators of cancer. So patients are more empowered with knowledge to prevent cancer in the first place. 
they also are being en enlisted increasingly so into more screening uh, strategies where the chances for cure is greatest. And that has led to profound reductions uh, in breast, pan pancreas, uh, uh, prostate cancer, uh, and other diseases, colon cancer in particular. Uh, so those are uh, attitudinal changes. That is, you can do something about the disease, either prevent it, catch it early. And now I'd say over the last half a dozen years in particular, uh, because of the insights that have been illuminated by a great deal of research over the last several decades, we now have a clear line of sight for many cancers as to how we can really bend the arc of those diseases for those patients. So patients feel a lot more hopeful uh, as a result of the enhanced diagnostics, the enhanced capabilities that we have on the treatment fronts and so on. And we, as a result, we have uh, increasing survivors with improved quality of life and so on. But we're nowhere near where we need to be yet. You know, I remember my first uh, newspaper job was in the 1970s, an internship with the Wichita Eagle in my hometown, where we did an obituary on every person who died in the state of Kansas. I did many of those obituaries. And families would ask you not to say. Yeah. or refuse to acknowledge if someone had died of cancer. And we had a practice at the Wichita Eagle that we would accede to that and say they just died after a long illness, which was kind of a yeah. code word because it was seen as so terrible to have had cancer at that point. Well, so talk about the turning points. What's made this? You talk about a breathtaking ride. Um, it's in the last decade or two. What's been the turning point, the pivot that's made so much difference? What, is there one? I think the big turning point was really getting an understanding of the fundamental reasons why good cells go bad and why a cell that normally behaves the way it's supposed to, grows when it's supposed to, stops when it's supposed to, starts just growing despite all the signals that should have shut it down. And that really comes out of the Varmus and Bishop recognition that there are genes in our own instruction book which, if mutated in certain ways, uh, cause this to happen. Some of them genes which, when you activate them, uh, make the cell grow when it shouldn't, sort of the stuck accelerator uh, metaphor, oncogenes. Others which are supposed to apply the brakes, and if you lose both copies, it's like losing your front and rear brakes. Uh, the cell keeps growing when it should have stopped, the so-called tumor suppressor genes. And then other variations on top of that, DNA mismatch repair, more recently things we're learning about the epigenome that we might want to talk about. But basically to have that kind of understanding about the mechanics of what controls cell growth was the essential step to move us into a more directed, more rational approach instead of an empirical, well, let's just try this and see what happens. Because mm -hmm. most of our strategies until we had that kind of understanding were to come up with toxic substances that were harmful to cells that were dividing rapidly and try to somehow dial this in at the point where you were killing the cancer cells a little bit more than the normal cells, knowing that you were not going to get by without a great deal of side effects and toxicity. Let's talk about the, the breakthroughs the, and the yeah, pivot the, point. the historical perspective here, I think, is extremely important. And you touched on one critical event, which was uh, the Varmus Bishop paradigm this genetic paradigm that now dominates our thinking in cancer. But in, in the 1960s, there was a vigorous debate as to whether or not mutations in genes had anything to do with cancer. So some of the most significant minds of the last century honestly thought that mutations of genes of cells are not relevant for the development of cancer, Peyton Rouse. And there was a special irony in his stance because it was his discovery of a virus which contained an, a, a gene that caused cancer that led Varmus and Bishop to their seminal Nobel Prize winning breakthrough in 76, that there are genes within us that look like the genes that cause cancer and viruses. And then when I, the year I was graduated in 81, we began to identify mutations in those genes. The first oncogenes were translocated or they were mutated. They were changed in cancer cells versus normal cells. Then it took a while for us to begin to develop those uh, collection of genes that were real drivers of the disease. And a real a critical breakthrough occurred uh, in the 1990s, thanks to Dr. Collins uh, and the Human Cancer, the Human Genome Project, which gave us the blueprint for the human uh, genome. Then in, in 2007, we had the Human Cancer Genome initiated, again, under Dr. Collins' leadership. And that now has given us the periodic table for cancer, where we know a lot 
perhaps not all, but most of the genetic elements that are rogue that actually commandeer the biology of a cell. To me, the most significant advance uh, against the backdrop of the foundation that I just described occurred within a narrow window, 2009, 2010, where across a very broad front, there was a critical mass of knowledge that was prosecutable, where we understood what caused certain cancers and we could do something about it if we just reduced that knowledge to practice, but also game-changing technological advances across a broad front. Uh, the ability to sequence genomes, not in a decade, in 1990s, at billions of dollars, mm -hmm but for thousands of dollars in a time period where you can make clinical decisions. That was game changing for patient care. Also advances in imaging. Just only a couple of decades ago, the most common procedure in surgery was a laparotomy because you have to look inside to see what's going on. Today we have non-invasive imaging and so on. The advances there are also profound. Cognitive computing, our ability to take and aggregate large volumes of data and use very powerful analytics that allow us not only to understand a disease, but to actually inform clinical decision making on that disease uh, is before us. So what's exciting to me is that within a very narrow window, we now have a very, we're in a good position to make a more deliberate assault on the cancer problem. And this was something that just didn't exist because it took the decades of research fundamental research for us to be able to really move that knowledge to a position where we can now act on it decisively to help patients. So if those are the breakthroughs that have brought us to the point where we are today, what are you looking for? What's gonna, what, what is the breakthrough ahead that's going to make a great difference, do you think? What are you looking for? Well, as Ron very articulately spoke about, we have now the tools for any individual who's developed cancer uh, to read exactly what's going on inside that tumor, what's making those cells grow. And that allows you to move what has been a one-size-fits-all operation into a personalized approach. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing that we can do that because every tumor, if you look closely, is a little different than the others. Uh, you take uh, uh, 10 people who have lung cancer and you actually ask what's driving the cancer in those 10 people, it will be a different collection of these oncogenes and tumor suppressors and other players. And that means that if you're trying to design a truly rational therapy, you want to know that uh, so that you can choose mm -hmm. your intervention accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some complexity here, of course, because uh, that means that maybe the old way of doing a cancer clinical trial where you just say anybody who's got this particular cancer in this particular organ becomes uh, a, an appropriate candidate. Not so much if you have a targeted therapy that you know goes specifically after a particular genetic change, the people that are going to have the best chance of responding and where you most want to run your trial are those that have that genetic change. Sounds a little vague, but let me give you an example. Uh, patients with lung cancer, which is obviously a very scary disease that we have not done so great on over the course of many years. Uh, there are individuals who have lung cancer who have a rearrangement of a particular gene called ALK, uh, and it drives their cells uh, to grow when they're not supposed to. There is a recently developed and very rapidly FDA-approved drug, thanks to the trials that have been done here, called crizotinib, which basically works in a very specific way to stop the growth of those cells that have that ALK rearrangement. But it doesn't do a thing uh, for the rest of the lung cancer patients who don't have that rearrangement. And it's only about 5 or 6%, I think, uh, that actually are in that category. So that's really different. In the past, lung cancer, well, some radiation, some strong chemotherapy, everybody got the same thing. Not anymore. That's why the uh, lung map effort, which was mentioned in the introduction uh, that Friends for Cancer Research and Ellen and Marlene have played such an important role in getting this forward, is a great example of where we need to go. Initially as a clinical trial, but soon this ought to be standard of care where you have the chance. Uh, if you have that cancer, have it diagnosed right down to the, you know, the base pair. Uh, figure out what that three billion uh, uh, letter instruction book looks like in the cancer. Then look at the menu of targeted drugs which are being developed 
at a phenomenal pace, there must be about a thousand of them now in clinical trials, and pick out the ones that are going to be a match uh, with what's in your tumor, and that ought to be the place you want to go. Now, one more thing which we should talk about. At the present time, we still are pretty much in a circumstance where that idea of rational uh, drug uh, treatment for cancer based on understanding what's in that tumor is a single drug, a monotherapy. And that can give you dramatic responses, but unfortunately those responses usually don't last. Uh, they are dramatic remissions, but they're not cures. Mm -hmm. We should not be surprised by that when you consider that by the time a cancer has been diagnosed, the number of cancer cells that that person has is in the billions. It only takes one or two of those cells that have developed a different mutation that makes them resistant uh, to the drug to grow back. Uh, the drug's given, it looks like everything's fine, but that small number of resistant cells is still there, it comes back. How should we deal with that? Well, think about HIV. It's a very similar kind of situation. Uh, when people were diagnosed uh, with HIV and we treated them with one drug, AZT, you got a response, but it came back because the virus developed uh, a resistance. Well, human cells have that same ability. How do we now treat HIV? With three drugs, because that way you, you reduce the chance of a resistant virus essentially to zero. We need to reduce the chance of a resistant cancer cell uh, to zero. And that's going to be combination therapies mm -hmm. of these rational drugs. And that's a hard problem to figure out how to put forward. But from my perspective, maybe that's our big current challenge, our big frontier, but our big hope for going beyond responses and remissions to cures. Yes. Dr. DePino. So I think that uh, when we think about reducing cancer mortality, which is really the bottom line, yes. Uh, and Francis spoke to precision medicine and the promise of that. And in fact, I think we've seen proof that that is, in fact, a way to go. Uh, when we think about cancer, particularly in uh, emerging countries, um, the challenges of uh, limiting resources really means that we also have to approach the cancer problem on other fronts and be very aggressive. 50% of cancers can be prevented. The exciting thing that today is that we actually understand a lot of the instigators of cancer, and we can do things policy-wise, education-wise, so that we can really reduce the incidence up front of cancer. And that's a great opportunity. Think HPV vaccination for children. Over 400,000 deaths could be averted each year around the world. Tobacco, public health problem number one, expected to extract 500 million premature deaths over the next 50 years worldwide. Uh, the challenges of hepatitis, uh, in it, uh, excessive UV exposure, these are, during childhood, these are all opportunities where we can bend the arc of the disease. Then in the screening, the chances for cure is much greater with earlier stage cancers, especially solid tumors. Uh, and so we, again, we have proof that this is the case. So if we can enhance our ability to detect these cancers earlier, and we're on a path to doing that, thanks to the NIH, that will also be one of the lowest of the low-hanging fruit to really reduce cancer mortality. And then lastly, on the treatment front, uh, the targeted therapy going after the genes that are aberrant in the cancer cell, what is particularly exciting now is this new dimension of immunotherapy, mm -hmm. which doesn't really speak to what's going on inside the cell, but instead harnesses the power of the immune system in the host reawakens it so that it recognizes the cancer and now can attack the cancer. And those therapies are giving durable responses in a large fraction of patients with advanced disease. And so I think if we begin to combine the targeted therapies going after the genes, harness the power of the immune system, I think what you're going to see over the next five to 10 years are significant reductions in cancer mortality. We're already seeing that for melanoma. We'll be seeing it for renal cell carcinoma uh, and a variety of other cancers. This is across a broad front. You know, this sounds extremely complex, though, for doctors to do targeted therapy based on specific gen genetic mutations. And I wonder if, uh, if doctors, it's one thing to be at a great institution like MD Anderson mm -hmm. and get that level of care. Mm -hmm. What if you're at some other place? Yeah. Do, are doctors able to generally keep up and, and uh, provide 
the kind of really sophisticated complex care that you're saying is making such a difference? So at the next day of an FDA approval, it becomes standard of care at MD Anderson or other great institutions like Sloan Kettering or George Washington here uh, in, um, in this area, so on and so forth. The, the issue is really the knowledge gap that you're referring to, and it's a very significant one. Uh, and the IOM gave this report on the uh, uh, unevenness of cancer care throughout the United States. On average, uh, for example, the mutation of, in lung cancer, EGF receptor, when there was a new therapy, it took on average seven years in a community setting for that to become routinely used in the public domain. So that knowledge gap is a critical issue, and it is widening because of this staggering complexity where physicians don't have uh, a, the chance to keep up. At MD Anderson alone, we publish 10 papers per day. And so it's not possible to keep up with the torrent of data. What I find very exciting now, and MD Anderson is embarked on this oncology expert advisor powered by IBM Watson, is to be able to ingest data automatically, clinically, in, in a community setting, not just in the walls of MD Anderson, and have that system uh, be taught by the world's experts. So what would they do? It's essentially a second opinion, a decision support system. And that would then give advice to the treating physician that this is what the world's experts would do. And if you're failing standard of care, well, these would be the clinical trials that you should consider and so on. I think that this is going to dramatically improve the standard of care once those technologies get implemented across a broad front. And I think that we're being in this age of information. I think this, in fact, is going to be on a practical level, perhaps the most impactful in reducing the burden of cancer in our country. Do you worry about this, uh, Dr. Collins? And if so, what can you do about it? Absolutely. I mean, we don't have a very good track record in terms of taking the results of research that are proven to be beneficial and finding how they integrate into the standard of care uh, across the country. In fact, uh, a few years ago, somebody kind of looked at that uh, timetable and concluded for many things that approached 20 years, and that's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, there are good news sort of aspects, though, to the way things are going. Ron has just talked about uh, some that relate to, to the cancer field. I think uh, the best part uh, of this story really is that patients are no longer comfortable sitting back waiting for somebody else to make decisions about their care. We are in the era of the empowered patient and the internet has made that increasingly possible uh, even for individuals who have no medical background to be able to ferret out information and ask pointed questions about how come you're doing this when it looks to me like you should be doing that. And that alone motivates physicians uh, to Keep get up. up to speed. No physician wants to be embarrassed <laughs> by their lack of understanding of something that a patient has just brought to their attention. So we are seeing, I think, some improvement in that regard. I think the advent of the electronic health record ought to also uh, oh, be an wow. opportunity there and ought to provide an opportunity for more patients to have access to clinical trials which of course in childhood cancer is the case now for most kids with cancer, but for adults it's still two, three percent, something like that, which is a, a missed opportunity both for the research community and especially for patients who would have benefited by enrolling in a trial that might have given them access to something that could have been much more targeted for their needs. But we have to work hard on this. The other part of this, of course, one has to point out is reimbursement. If we're going to see these kinds of advances find their way into the standard of care, then it has to be clear that they're worth paying for. And that's a challenge uh, with many of these new developments being sufficiently new that they haven't completely gone through the reimbursement discussions and some of the new drugs are expensive. And so we have that issue as well. There was a piece on 60 Minutes uh, a week ago about the high cost of cancer drugs. And it, it made it sound like it was pretty random how much a cancer drug cost, is it? I mean, what determines uh, the cost of some of these very expensive well, drugs? Well, I think the more fundamental question there, um, and that's an important issue, is really to think about what actually drives the costs. Um, at the end of the day, for us to incentivize innovation, to address major unmet medical need, particularly in pediatric cancers or rare cancers, et cetera, uh, we have to do a much better job in reducing the extraordinarily high rate of failure in cancer drug development and testing. So for every 20 drugs that enter into clinical trials today, only one will succeed in becoming an FDA-approved drug. 
And so that's 95% failure rate. Uh, and 56% uh, of those failures occur in phase three clinical trials, where the cost is very high. And patients are sometimes benefiting, but they don't achieve statistical significance. So certain drugs don't get approved that perhaps could get approved for certain individuals and vice versa. If you look at the root causes of why we fail, it's because we're not doing enough at the preclinical stage to do the science needed to validate the target, to develop a drug against the target, to test that drug in a very sophisticated preclinical model system, and develop a clear hypothesis as to what patients you're going to be given the drug to in a clinical setting and know within two dozen patients whether or not that hypothesis has been validated. If we did it that way and, and put more effort on the front end, you would reduce the very high rate of failure, and that would reduce the, drug, the cost of developing these drugs, because these drugs are significant in their expense, in part because we're paying for the high number of failures that occur in the clinical setting. So someone has to pay for that, the taxpayer, mm -hmm. the government, the uh, investors, the patients with co-pays, et cetera. So I think the key issue for us to focus on is how is it that we can actually reduce the cost of developing drugs, one, and secondly, to the point of precision medicine before, which patients would truly benefit from getting that drug, where they would have a durable response, low toxicity, so that they could have an impact on their disease. And so that, I, I would like to see the dialogue be more balanced in thinking about what the root causes are and the issues are, um, as opposed to some of the dialogue that's, you know, that has been recently in the public domain. So I totally agree with what Ron is, is saying there. And I think NIH is certainly more invested than ever in trying to identify ways in the preclinical space uh, to be sure that you're chasing after a molecule that's going to succeed and not one that's going to crash and burn in phase three after you've already spent hundreds of millions of dollars on it. And that means our preclinical models have to be increasingly reliable. Uh, we have cured cancer in mice more times than I can tell you. And we will continue to cure cancer in mice if it's something that we are sure is a good model. But I think some of the time we've been misled uh, by the animal models we've been using. It's what we had. And uh, it, it gave us answers, but sometimes they weren't the answers we needed. So increasingly, I think, uh, in that front end uh, of the development pipeline, we need to know a lot more, all the way down to the, you know, the three-dimensional structure of that uh, particular drug and how does it fit like a lock and key into its target and is that optimal, to questions about off-target toxicities, which we can now do in very elaborate ways using human cells on biochips to see whether this particular compound that we're thinking of putting into an actual clinical trial actually does something bad to the heart cells or to the kidney cells, because we can do that now. This is really cool stuff. You can take a skin biopsy from any one of you, uh, add the appropriate collection of four genes, turn that particular set of cells into so-called pluripotent cells, then coax them into becoming heart or muscle or, as of last week, beta cells from your pancreas uh, or brain cells, and you can then put them on a chip and bathe them in the substance that you're thinking about maybe giving to you or somebody else as a cancer drug and find out whether there's some unexpected oopsies there that you really want to know about. And that way, basically fail early if you're going to fail, which is really important, but also have much higher throughput for testing candidates because uh, the old way we do this is slow and it's expensive and involves small animals and large animals. We can do better now uh, with a lot of the tissue engineering capabilities mm -hmm. that have emerged, many of them in just the last few years. But bottom line, uh, what Ron says is right. Unless we come up with ways to reduce the failure rate for drug development, drugs are going to cost a lot of money because companies have to remain somehow solvent. And when they have to pay for all those failures, the cost of success gets knocked much higher than you would want it to be. Yeah, I was distressing this article, this uh, 60 Minutes piece described bankruptcy as a common side effect of cancer, which is a very distressing, I think, for everyone. So if the goal is curing cancer, cur curing all kinds of cancers, what's the biggest hurdle? What could make the most difference now in trying to uh, progress along this path? Maybe each of you take this one. Well, I can start because I don't know if he can say this uh, being in the position that he's in, but one of the greatest proven success stories in the history of the nation 
has been our investment in fundamental research and now translational research that has converted knowledge, basic insights into things that matter for patients. And what is very exciting to us, you know, when we went to school and, you know, didn't even understand the genes that were resident in cancer and how the immune system worked, we were flying blind. At this point, we have a very clear line of sight in making an impact on the cancer problem worldwide through prevention, through screening, and through therapeutic advances, which are truly game changing. And we, patients are dying, families are being impacted. This nation needs to make a decisive assault on the cancer problem and other diseases for which we have a very strong conceptual foundation at this point. So we need to act, we need to act decisively because as the US goes, so goes the world. We need to invest in our research and translational activities so that we can really make a difference in this decade in the cancer problem. Is it fundamentally a matter of, of money? Is that the number one thing? We are not limited by ideas. Uh, we're not limited by talent. I think we are limited by resources. When you look at the opportunities now scientifically in the field of cancer and in many other disorders as well, I could say the same thing about Alzheimer's disease or diabetes or autism, rare diseases, common diseases. We're at this remarkable moment uh, scientifically. It is exhilarating to see how this landscape changes almost daily. And that's one of my uh, great uh, blessings and privileges as the director of the NIH is to look across that landscape and see what's happening almost every day. I'm sure you're reading my blog, by the way, because I write about that twice a week. Are you tweeting that? Because <laughs> I'm tweeting it yeah, too. Right? I have 36,000 followers. I hope some of you are <laughs> on that list. <laughs> It is amazing to see the insights, and they're coming out of all sorts of technologies that we didn't have before. Imaging, you mentioned. I mean, the things we can do with imaging now are phenomenal and getting better. Uh, the whole genomics revolution, giving us insight into how cells work and how things go wrong sometimes. Uh, the, the efforts to understand sort of the details uh, of uh, clinical phenotypes, and the advent of electronic health records. Uh, all of these things sort of coming together in a way that I would not have imagined would happen in my lifetime. And yet, we are not nurturing uh, that engine of discovery uh, the way that we could be. And a statistic that I think uh, is particularly troubling and oftentimes really discouraging to young scientists who are thinking about getting into this field is the following. What's your chance if you have a great idea about cancer research? Well, and it's preclinical. It's not something you're working in a company. You're working in an academic institution, but you have that next idea. Where are you going to go to get funded? To the NIH. What's your chance that your grant is going to get funded? It's about one in six. Traditionally, over most of the last 50 years, it's been one in three. In the Cancer Institute, I think it's one in 10, actually. It's even lower. Now, you might say, well, you know, maybe we were funding too much stuff before and we weren't uh, putting a tight enough uh, sort of filter on this. And the filter, of course, is rigorous peer review uh, by experts in the field. But we actually went back and looked. You know, this was actually in heart disease research, but I would imagine it's probably true across the board. Uh, back around the year 2000, when we were funding uh, a third of the grants, up to the 30th percentile, and we asked, is a grant that got funded at the 10th percentile, does that turn out to be more productive than a grant that got funded at the 25th percentile? Because clearly peer review thought one was a little better than the other. And you can actually look and see, okay, what happened? Did they change the field? Uh, did they come up with uh, discoveries that have made a difference? And guess what? There's not a difference that anybody can tell you uh, is real between the 10th percentile and the 25th percentile. They're both great. And they're great now. And that says we're leaving half the great science on the table right now. Just at this moment of great opportunity. That is the thing that wakes me up at night. Uh, that is the thing that has caused a lot of the biomedical research community uh, to really uh, hunker down. And many individuals sort of deciding after a couple of failures, this isn't worth it anymore, and uh, going on to do something else, or going to another country where the support happens to be better. We alone. Uh, of the developed countries are the ones cutting back on biomedical research. Look and see what's happened in Europe or China or Singapore or South Korea, Brazil. Uh, they're going the other way. They're reading our playbook from
from the 1980s and 1990s and trying to be what we once were. Is that America's vision? Is that where we really want to go? That's that's very chilly. It must be agonizing to it make is. decisions on funding some of these grants, what to fund, what not to it fund. It is, because I know we are turning away some brilliant ideas. We may have just turned down in the latest study section the next Nobel Prize without realizing it. It could have happened. And we may have basically convinced a young investigator who's now trying for the third time and not quite making the cut that it's time to go to law school. Not that there's anything wrong with going to law school, but I think we do need science here. Dr. Tomeno, talk about collaboration among researchers. Is that something that's 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 changed? You you mentioned, for instance, the, the lung map, lung cancer yep. effort. Is there more collaboration now than there used no, to be? No, there's no question there's more collaboration. For centuries, okay. academia celebrated the individual. Um, but now we see multidisciplinary activities being brought to bear on very complex, large-scale projects because it does take this village of activities in order to really move the needle. So you really need to bring together the collection of disciplines, you, the technologies, and so on, to really be able to prosecute these ideas, these very complex clinical trials like a lung map. Uh, so we're seeing that because folks recognize that in order to achieve the goal that they wanted to have in their careers, which is to make an impact on the cancer problem, that they have to do that in collaboration with other team members. But science continues and should uh, support individual investigators, that lone wolf out there that will make some seminal discovery that will change the world. An example of that is Jim Allison at MD Anderson, uh, who in the 1990s was for trying to figure out why the immune system is asleep at the wheel in cancer. And it was his discovery of a molecule that was a break on the immune system and a drug against that break that led to this whole new class of therapeutics. And that was individual investigator-initiated activity that now has brought into the arena a multidisciplinary effort to bring that to full fruition. Do you think that would be funded now if he came forward with that crazy idea? Well, he, uh, back then, even had a bit of a challenging time. He was a, he was a real maverick, right? We need mavericks. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and when, when you are uh, out there, there's no conceptual uh, precedent, mm -hmm. uh, you have to have, you know, the judgment to recognize that, uh, you know, this may have uh, opportunity. So obviously those grants will not fare well in this uh, very draconian setting of uh, limiting resources. Well, you've been affected, the NIH, by the breakdown of the budget process in Washington by sequester. Uh, <laughs> Shut down. <laughs> Shut down. What, what makes this work better? I mean, does, it, does it, the whole government have to work better for things to work better for, for your agency? Because yeah. good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have lost 23% of our purchasing power uh, for medical research over the last 10 years. And a big chunk of that uh, happened in 2013 uh, with the sequester, which in one fell swoop took away $1.6 billion. It would have gone to medical research. And we've not recovered from that. And if anybody thinks the sequester is over, uh, remember that they are a deal that was made for 14 and 15, uh, thanks to the hard work of Patty Ryan, uh, Patty Murray and, and uh, Congressman Ryan, uh, is just a two-year deal. And in 16, sequester comes back. Uh, unless action is taken, uh, that's where we will be. And uh, the projections are that NIH would then lose over the next 10 years about $19 billion that would have gone to medical research just following that trajectory, which is basically the default of what's going to happen next. Um, you know, I'm an optimist, and believe it or not. Uh, I think Winston Churchill was right when he said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other options. <laughs> and uh, the case here is so compelling. I mean. It is not just that this is the engine that has led us uh, to advances in longevity and lives saved from many different diseases, including many from cancer. It's also been probably the best driver of economic growth since World War II, and everybody's interested in seeing the economy grow. I'll give you one statistic, the Genome Project, which I had the privilege of leading. Uh, Battelle recently did an analysis of what's been the economic benefits to the United States of the roughly $4 billion that was spent on the Genome Project over that 13-year period. 
and they came up with a close to a trillion dollar answer. Uh, basically 178 to one was the return on investment for the money that went into the Genome Project. The Women's Health Initiative, similar analysis done a few months ago, 141 to one as the return on investment from that uh, very important project looking at women's health and what works and what doesn't work. We're starting down the path to look at the Brain Initiative and I'm sure there's gonna be all kinds of technologies that spin out of that that are going to create new businesses and economic growth, but we're struggling to try to get this off the ground at the level that it really should be. So there are all these arguments. And whenever I have a chance uh, to speak to members of Congress about this or people in the administration, er everybody says, you know, you're right, this is really something we should be doing. But we are all caught in this current gridlock, uh, this inability to come to a long range plan about how resources uh, in this country are gonna be spent. And, we continue to be, as part of the discretionary budget, uh, kind of the victims of that long, drawn-out process uh, that has not reached uh, a conclusion. Again, I'm just enough of an optimist to think that ultimately uh, the case will be so compelling as to be irresistible and uh, we will turn this corner. But I hope it happens soon. And when we do turn the corner, what I hope we will then get into is not another doubling of the NIH. That was great from 98 to 2003, mm -hmm. but in a way it sort of sowed the seeds of what happened next, namely, okay, you've been doubled, we don't have to worry about you anymore, and then we lost ground, now, now we've been now undu undoubled. undoubled. <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, what we need is stable, predictable trajectory. Mm -hmm. Then you can plan. Mm -hmm. Then young scientists can say, there's a career for me here and it's not gonna get pulled away from me uh, by one of these terrible downturns. We're not gonna have a roller coaster, we're gonna actually have a smooth, predictable pathway. That's what medical research needs. If we could recover that again, and there are certainly people in the Congress who are advocating for that. Talk to Senator Durbin, for instance, who has a bill uh, pushing that particular model. Why should that be a partisan effort? It certainly is something that everybody has a stake in. Everybody who has a family member or a friend with medical illness looking for answers. This is how we address those. I'm gonna ask one more question, then I'm gonna to turn to the audience. So you might be thinking about a question that, that you have that has occurred to you. Um, but Dr. Trino, before we do that, you mentioned prevention as being something mm -hmm. that could prevent 50% 50 50 of, of 50 cancers. 50% of cancers. And we, we all know cigarette smoking, pretty familiar. Anybody yeah, who doesn't 30, 30 know? Yes, 30% right. of all cancer deaths, tobacco but related. I, 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 did you get the sense as a non medical professional that every week something either says it does or doesn't cause cancer? And so I Googled this yesterday in preparing for this. I, I Googled uh, news stories, what causes cancer? I found headlines from the last couple of weeks that say, wearing a bra does not cause cancer, which is good enough. <laughs> Local mom wonders about artificial turf's cancer risk. Uh, that's a new thing to worry about. We see a lot of stories recently about the link between obesity and cancer. Mm -hmm. Is this all um, helpful, do you think, to people? Or do people feel a little whiplashed by what they should and shouldn't be doing? Well, there is evidence-based strategies that rests on a solid bedrock of knowledge that really does make an impact, a profound impact on health and well-being. And I think this gets back to some of the things we talked about earlier. You know, going on a website, for example, to find out what you could do to prevent cancer, these are very generic, broad-based uh, recommendations. But what you want to know, or what I want to know, is how often should we be screened for what? What are our risk factors? What can we do to modulate our disease? And so what you're going to be seeing with a lot of these technologies is really personalized wellness as well, where you're going to be able to, based on your family history, genetics, the kinds of foods you eat, et cetera, the environment that you live in, you may have different levels of screening or different things that you might eat uh, in order to really change the trajectory of diseases that might afflict you versus someone else. So personalized wellness, I think, is also going to be an important aspect of what we do. But for the big ones, the 800-pound gorillas, smoking is public health problem number one. Second, we have obesity as a major problem in the United States and in other countries. Uh, this is a big problem that really does truly impact on the incidence of certain cancers. We have viruses. I mentioned HPV as well as hepatitis virus, which are major causes of, of cancer deaths uh, worldwide. Uh, many other uh, elements. Those are what's interesting about all of those uh, is that many of those are operative during childhood. 
And if we think about what we can do to really change the trajectory of how we manage health and well-being in the United States and other countries, I think we have a missed opportunity in K through 12 to really teach children, as we did with traffic safety and seatbelts, to influence them and give them the knowledge that they need so that at the right time in their lives they develop the habits that they need. 88% of adult smokers start as kids. Childhood sunburns causes melanoma later. HPV needs to be given during childhood in order to protect against HPV infection later in life. 80% of the human population is HPV positive, okay? Depends on which subtype you get as to whether or not you're going to get disease. So these are, uh, in my view, cancer prevention is a child care issue. I think that we have a responsibility to make sure that our children are empowered with knowledge and protected in the way that they should be protected so that they will have a, a f future that's um, lower incidence of cancer for them and their family. You know, Dr. Collins mentioned the empowered patient is a positive thing. Does every doctor see it that way when a patient comes in and says, you might have been Googling my disease and I have some thoughts? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, we, you see it increasingly that, the, that patients are uh, empowered by knowledge. Uh, but I'd say the challenges are really on both sides, that there aren't a sufficient number of patients that, in fact, have that kind of uh, mentality. But also physicians don't always automatically recommend what they should be doing to prevent disease. A good example of this is uh, we're, we are front of mind with respect to tobacco cessation at MD Anderson. We're very passionate about this. And what we found was that if you get enlisted into a tobacco cessation program, professional program, it's 37% success versus 5% for self-quit. So it's a great opportunity. The challenge is that the physicians who are busy don't always remember, even at a place like MD Anderson, mm -hmm. that these patients should be referred to the cessation clinic. So now we did that automatically. It's, it's in the uh, EHR, in the med med electronic uh, health record, and as soon as it goes in, the patient automatically gets referred to the tobacco cessation clinic, and it has increased five-fold the number of referrals, even at a place like MD Anderson. So I think that there are technologies that we can exploit that can really impact on the front end of the problem, prevention and screening e efforts. So this is obviously a really smart group of people with intelligent questions to ask of your own. So let me turn it over to you. Yes, please, go ahead. And I think we were going to wait for the mic, and I think they, they'd like you to identify yourself, if you would, please. Uh, it seems that the underlying uh, argument is that you do not have enough resources, monetary resources. Have you ever thought of working with other countries as a team as opposed to doing it alone? I mean, it seems to be the most intelligent the NIH, way of dealing with that situation. No, Thanks it's a great much. question, and we probably should have addressed this already. Absolutely. Uh, the problems are so important, the resources are so limited that we'd be crazy not to figure out a way to bring all of the parties together. Uh, for cancer genomics, for instance, uh, there's an international cancer genome consortium, which has many countries working together to build this amazing database that Ron was talking about of what do you see if you have hundreds of lung cancers and hundreds of ovarian cancers and hundreds of gastric cancers. Every country has a slightly different epidemiology of which cancers appear there, so it's great that you can tap into that. All the countries that were part of that agreed that they would follow the same standards about the quality of the data and the data access so that everybody could see the information. And that was sort of built upon the Human Genome Project itself, which was six countries, 20 labs. It was my job to be the field general, but a lot of the people who were doing the work were not even in the U.S. They didn't really have to listen to me, but they basically all agreed this was so important that we're going to work together. Um, I'm also the, the chair of something called the Heads of International Research Organizations. And around that table, when we meet every six months, are the CEOs of the public funding uh, agencies and some private philanthropies like Howard Hughes and Gates that account for about 95% uh, of the dollars public that go into public funding of biomedical research. And we are constantly looking for ways that we can be synergistic with each other and not duplicate. Sometimes we duplicate on purpose because we want to see, okay, it worked in that setting, does it work in this setting? And sometimes we get surprised. But you're absolutely right. And the same could be said about working with the private sector. I've probably spent more time mm -hmm. talking with heads of R&D, of Big Pharma, than any of my predecessors. 
in this role trying to figure out ways that we could knock down some of those barriers as long as the data is accessible, which we will insist upon. And we've made some pretty interesting models happen in that regard. And likewise with foundations, trying to figure out ways that philanthropy can fill in some of the gaps. Although if you add up all the philanthropic contributions, it's still far short of what NIH lost in the sequester. So it's all sort of relative. You may have yeah, the, examples N the NCI has uh, launched the global program this past year under <clears throat> Harold Normus. Um, MD Anderson has been on the global front for quite a few years now. We have 30 sister institutions in 23 countries. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to work not just with great institutions in those other countries to elevate their quality of care and research, uh, but also we work with governments in those countries as well as media so that we can really drive both policy and education of the population. Uh, it really is important that we, it's not simply resources that is important, but there are organizational opportunities mm -hmm. that relate to these sorts of collaborations between the private sector and public uh, and also with other countries and so on. It's a big problem. Many nations that are now solving their communicable disease problems are now being faced with an aging population uh, and they are concerned about this collision course that they're going to be facing decades from now with Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, and so on, diseases of aging. And this is a big problem worldwide. We have uh, estimated by 2025, 1.2 billion people over the age of 60 because we've essentially doubled life expectancy over the last 70 years. Big problem. Thanks very much. Thanks for your question. Do we have another question? Yes, please go ahead and wait for the microphone and yes. you'll want to know where was, the microphone is. And she's holding it. Yeah, I was wondering. Oh, if, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll go to you next. Yeah. I was wondering if the age of your parents when you are born would affect your chances of getting cancer because I've read that older parents, you know, their children are more likely to be autistic. They're also more likely to have Down syndrome. And I've also read that if your mother was younger when you were born, you're more likely to live longer. So I just wonder if the age of a person's parents has any effect on your chances of having cancer. Thanks very much. Sure, what a thoughtful question. So yes, we do know there are certain consequences that occur when parents are older than the average, and you mentioned a couple of them. Uh, certainly as uh, maternal age goes up, the risk of chromosome abnormalities, most prominently Down syndrome, but also others, uh, increases rather gradually, but it's clearly a, a statistical change. As fathers get older, uh, there are more new mutations uh, that occur uh, in the DNA. And now that we can sequence entire genomes, we can actually be very precise about that. Uh, if your father was sort of average age, sort of 20s, early 30s, you probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 new mutations in your DNA instruction book, where maybe he had a T and you've got a C because it got miscopied. Uh, and that seems to be true across multiple different groups. But if your father was 50 years old, you might have 100 or 110. Now, why is that? Well, that's because the process of spermatogenesis means that cell division is happening all the way along. And the older the father is, the more that sperm has gone through more copying opportunities and therefore more chances for a mutation to appear. Uh, it's a modest effect, but it is Very clear modest. that if you're looking at a condition like autism, where we know new mutations do play a role, at least in some cases, the risk goes up a bit. If you're looking for a rare new mutation genetic disease, uh, you will find more often than the average that the father is a little older. Now, when it comes to cancer susceptibility, theoretically, I could imagine that might be the case if you had one more mutation or two more mutations because your father was a little older and they happen to fall in a very vulnerable place in the genome, like in the BRCA1 gene. Uh, but I don't know that that is enough that you would ever see the actual impact because it would be such a rare event to happen in that very vulnerable spot. So I'm not aware of evidence that cancer risk goes up with yeah, older that, parents. That is, that, you are. that is correct. I mean, the overwhelming factor for the development of cancer is our age. Uh, it dwarfs every other statistic, mm. uh, aside from tobacco, for example. 
uh, which dramatically increases your risk. But just simple changing demographics, aging of the United States is the single most important factor for the development of cancer. Mm. And by 2030, we anticipate just because of changing demographics and the aging of our nation, a 45% increase in the incidence of cancer just because of age. You talked before the program began about how the odds of getting cancer increases with each decade after, what did you say after 60? So for the grade four, so uh, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, every five years, the incidence of those diseases double. By the time you're 85, you have a 45% chance of having Alzheimer's. By the time you're 80, you have a roughly one in two chance if you're a male, one in three chance if you're a female. So getting back to the funding, both sides of the aisle recognize that it's not whether we can afford to do it, but can we afford not to support the solutions that would really impact on, for example, Alzheimer's. Today, we spend a quarter trillion dollars in today's dollars for 5.4 million Americans afflicted with the disease. By 2050, just from, again, changing demographics, we'll be spending a trillion dollars in today's dollars if we don't really impact on the disease. So we have to make a concerted effort to get out ahead of these problems in a way that we know we can through decisive research, application of that research, development of drugs, and so on, that would truly make an impact fundamentally on those age-related diseases. Not to mention the human cost involved with those diseases as well. Um, First, I think I I called on this person next, but she didn't have the mic, so let's go to her now. Thanks. Hi, I'm Karen Brooks with TBG Capital. Uh, First, I want to thank you both for a lifetime of service to science. Um, Could you speak a little bit to the most virulent forms of of cancer and the state of research and treatment for, say, brain tumors, brain cancer, and other such um, virulent forms of cancer? So we've made uh, tremendous progress across many different fronts. Uh, Among the most challenging, in fact, two diseases that I've spent most of my career studying in my laboratory uh, are glioblastoma, the the brain cancer that took uh, Senator Kennedy's life. Uh, and also pancreas cancer. Uh, There's been a tremendous amount of basic science work that has given us the atlas of genes that are aberrant in those cancers, really outstanding genetic model systems that help us understand what those genes do. But we are still faced with converting that information into therapies that truly change the natural history of those diseases. I'm cautiously optimistic of some early data that's beginning to emerge in the immunotherapy space, which may give us that foothold upon which we can then build quite uh, rapidly. A good example, another disease that I studied, again, because it was one of these really lethal virulent diseases, advanced melanoma. In there, pre-2009, there were very few advances that had any impact on survival statistics for advanced disease. And with the advent of this new immune therapy, we now have 23% of patients that appear to be cured. We could use the C word. These are some patients that are out 13 years. And this was uniformly lethal within six to nine months. 23% that we had durable responses. And now the addition of another immune modulating drug appears to be generating similar results in the majority of patients maybe as much as 80%. We can't say yet because it hasn't been around long enough. But if those curves, those survival curves continue, it could be that within the next five years with melanoma, we may have 80, 90% cure of those with advanced disease. And again, the perspective here is that there was nothing for these individuals, no hope. And that's an example of science being converted into new life-saving drugs. So I think with some of these other diseases, if we can really get a crack in the armor, then we can build on that rapidly through combinations because we do have this enormous capability technology to really figure out what's going on in these complex diseases. Just want to say. That is a very difficult one. The blood-brain barrier, getting drugs in, 
There's a whole bunch, same, th same thing for pancreas cancer, issues relating to drug penetration, etc. These are special problems for different diseases, and we need a concerted effort in each of those areas. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is a great opportunity, but we need a, a stronger critical mass of activity in this space, quite frankly. Let me say another word about uh, the immunotherapy approach, because I think this is so exciting. It's been built upon efforts over many decades that many people thought were just never going to pay off. And now here we are, Science Magazine last year calling cancer immunotherapy the breakthrough of the year not just in medical research, in all of science, astrophysics, whatever. It's cancer immunotherapy was the most exciting thing that happened in the view of the editors of Science Magazine. Uh, Ron has already talked about the way in which people like Allison have discovered how to unleash a sleeping immune system. That is, the tumor has managed to basically convince it to go into a swoon, and you figure out with a monoclonal antibody, how do you actually bring it back to life? But there's another even more sophisticated approach where you not only activate the immune system in a general way, but you train those T cells in the immune system to go after a target that you have identified in the tumor. And you basically give those T cells instruction. You educate them about what their target should be. And this is the chimeric antigen receptor strategy, or CAR, C-A-R developed by a number of groups. There's a paper from the NIH group in, in Lancet tomorrow describing dramatic results uh, with the CAR uh, approach, in that case in leukemias and lymphomas. But it's being tried in brain cancer. Uh, Steve Rosenberg at NIH has a trial ongoing. I happen to be watching it closely because a dear friend of mine uh, is one of the participants in the trial, a woman who lives in Michigan, and uh, she comes back every couple of months uh, to see what's happened. And uh, she's now two years out uh, without any evidence of regrowth, which is pretty darn good for this Very cancer. Good. Now, that's an anecdote. That's one case. But it is a fascinating strategy. And in this instance, it's, it's using the CAR approach, which uh, she refers to as those T cells or her little ninja warriors no. going after <laughs> those cells that need to be uh, basically wiped out. It's hard fought, it's really tough. And nobody who's dealt with brain tumors or with pancreas cancer uh, would say that this is anything but a really, really tough uh, problem with all kinds of personal consequences for those who get those diagnoses. But I would say we have a better set of ideas uh, and a better set of strategies uh, than we've ever had. And we just ought to put every bit of energy into making those real. You've talked about some kinds of cancer that are essentially cured now. You have such great success with them. What's going to be the last, the kind of cancer that is the last one solved? The last one that that will be, would it be brain and pancreatic cancer, or what would what would it, what do you think? I think there are some special challenges with diseases that show a staggering level of heterogeneity. So I wouldn't necessarily peg one specific cancer, but those cancers, such as GBM. Uh, pancreas cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer. It's as if a hand grenade went off in the nucleus and there is just massive wholesale rearrangement of the genome. And this is why the immune system is so exciting because it's designed to go after complexity. It's got, you know, many billions of combinations that it could deploy to identify that heterogeneity and why targeted therapy doesn't elicit those durable responses unless used in combination. So I think that it's really that category of disease for which there really has been wholesale change in the genome. And this is why I think if we can get the detection of cancer much earlier, uh, at a time in the life history of an aspiring cancer, to be able to inter intervene at a point where the, there are fewer cells, those cells have less le levels of genetic alteration, I think the fight uh, is one that could be won more readily for the, some of those earlier stage, more localized cancers. So again, it's the combination of the two. But brain cancer is a tough problem. Pancreas cancer, a very tough problem, in part because you not only have the instability, but you also have it behind barriers that thwart our ability to get adequate levels of drug into that system. 
Dr. Collins, did you want to add anything to that? I don't have a crystal ball. I guess I would not have expected that melanoma, widely metastatic melanoma, would be one of the early successes. I mean, it's not early enough, but earlier than some others. So I'm totally unable to predict what will be the last we're, one. We're constantly humbled. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we've got about five more minutes. Uh, so we've got lots more questions. Uh, who has the microphone? We'll that. Yeah. I'm a uh, head and neck cancer survivor and not caused by the HPV virus, but I have a great interest in that the vaccine. Do you feel that it, someday it will be mandatory? Well, uh, you know, in, as part of our Cancer Moonshots initiative at MD Anderson, we've embarked on a number of cancers where we're trying to push both policy education on a variety of different fronts, be it tobacco or proper use of vaccines and so on. I think it is an enormous missed opportunity for us not to vaccinate all of our children during the window of opportunity. Girls and boys. The girls and boys. In the case of head and neck, as an example, there is an epidemic, particularly amongst men. There is no pap smear like cervical cancer where we can identify these cancers early and you present very late in the disease and it extracts a very significant toll on those individuals. So there we have uh, hopefully later this year, early next year, the FDA uh, may approve the non-avalent vaccine. This is a unique opportunity that we have uh, where we can inspire our legislative bodies across the country to enact appropriate um, guidelines so that we can really protect our children. Um, it is an incredibly safe, incredibly effective vaccine. This is what we've been dreaming for, a vaccine that can prevent cancer from happening in the first place. This is manna from heaven. So we need to take advantage of this because anybody who feels that this vaccine should not be given I would ask them to come with me on the clinic and do one examination of a patient with advanced head and neck cancer, advanced cervical cancer, and you tell me what the appropriate course of action should have been for those individuals decades earlier. Again, it's a child care responsibility, and we as adults have a solemn responsibility to protect the health and well-being of our future generations. I have three children, ages 10. 12 and 13, all vaccinated, Girl, two, one boy and two girls. And yet you saw what a political football that became in your home state of Texas. Yes. yes. Well, I think the approach uh, that Governor Perry took uh, was one where he did the right thing, but he did not engage in the appropriate discussion that was needed so that there would be a general grassroots consensus. Um, we will uh, again approach the legislature in Texas uh, and a variety of other states, because MD Anderson is throughout the United States, uh, so that we can educate our legislators of the opportunity. It's important to appreciate this gets mixed up into sexual promiscuity and so on. The time there is one period during between ages nine and about 13 where there is optimal immune responsiveness to the vaccine. So uh, that is the window of opportunity. It's not like you can wait later on and say, well, let's make the decision at a later time. 80% of the world's population is infected when they, when they become adults. The vaccine does not work as effectively or at all later on. So the time to give this vaccine, a life-saving vaccine that can prevent over 400,000 deaths worldwide is in those ages. And we have to do, we, we must do it as a society. Did you want to add anything? I totally agree with what Moon just said. We are just about out of time. Maybe one last question. Um, Please, quick go ahead. question. If you could address the place of using viruses to treat cancer mm -hmm. in the spectrum of all the different avenues researchers are going down, do you have hope in that area? I'll say just a word, and Ron, I'm sure can add other specifics. It's certainly the way in which we've tried to approach cancer has many different avenues, small molecules, uh, biologics, monoclonal antibodies. And of course, uh, more traditional things like radiation, surgery. Uh, the virus approach often is because you're trying to arm the virus uh, to specifically go after the cancer cells. Oftentimes, it's a virus that you've engineered uh, in a gene therapy strategy. 
And I think there have been some advances in that regard, some of them actually in brain cancer, but not to the point where, at least in my view, uh, we can fully see how that is going to provide a major new weapon uh, in the armamentarium that we want to use for most cancers. You may have yeah, there are many viruses that are being utilized um, to uh, try to take advantage of uh, differences in cancer cells versus normal cells that viruses may replicate in cancer cells versus not replicating in normal cells. This provides us opportunities to really um, disrupt those cancer cells and lead to uh, death of the cancer cells. But as uh, Francis mentioned, the, this has not been as effective as one would imagine on the basis of that particular approach and paradigm. However, those viruses that are new antigens, um, when combined with immune modulation, may offer significant opportunities to train the immune system to now recognize these not only viral particles, but bystander mutations that are occurring in the cancer cell. So it may really prime the immune system further. There is some exciting work ongoing at MD Anderson with a particular engineered cold virus in brain cancer, which is showing some very impressive results, but in a subset of patients. And so we need to understand why certain patients are responding versus not. But uh, those are some pretty exciting opportunities. But I think that that regimen is going to need to be combined with other modalities to really bring out its full potential. We're out of time. I want to thank Dr. DePino, Dr. Collins, for such an interesting discussion. Thanks so much. I'd also like to uh, thank Dr. Collins, Dr. Peno, and Susan Page. And this was truly a fascinating conversation today. And you did an incredible job for setting the stage for this new uh, policy briefing series. Um, as president of Friends of Cancer Research and a longtime uh, supporter of the Aspen Institute, I can think of no better team to host this dialogue on cancer research in the 21st century. And so we look forward to continuing the conversation and welcome you all to participate as we showcase the success of medical research and preview exciting scientific uh, advances. Uh, this was truly amazing. Thank you so much. I, too, want to thank you for a really interesting conversation. Thank you. I expected the best, and we got it. It was fantastic. And I also want to thank our partners at Aspen for this wonderful series and all the people that work very hard with Friends of Cancer Research and at Aspen. I particularly want to thank my really good friend, Marlene Malik. I want to thank you for all you do for us and all you do for others every day. I thank you for your sponsorship and thank you for your friendship. And the Kovlers, Peter and Judy Kovler, you are enormous friends, you care deeply, and uh, we're deeply grateful for you, to you, at every level. So this is something that we care about deeply at Friends. This morning, um, Walter Isaacson was on a show. I probably shouldn't mention the show because it will show my politics, but, <laughs> but he said something that I thought was really interesting. It said, vision without execution is hallucination. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about his series. And we believe that at Friends also. We believe that we have to work with the best people in the world. We have to work with federal agencies, people like Francis, people like Ron, people, the best scientists, towards one goal, and that's to do better for patients. We have a North Star, and that is to get the patients the best treatment. We believe we cannot do this through isolation. We believe we have to do this with other people, and we're very deeply thankful to it. However, our research institutions are at peril, and we absolutely, if we are going to help patients, we have to fund the NIH, we have to fund the FDA, and we have to fund these centers that are really giving extraordinary care. So um, as we embark on these series with um, Aspen, we are going to next, uh, uh, we have a series of three, four, three. We'll do four. Maybe four. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Go on on vaccines. Uh, the next, uh, uh, the next series we will do is on the FDA, because as we know, the regulatory bodies are really crucial 
for innovation, and you will hear about what they're doing to get ready for this onslaught of extraordinary breakthroughs that we're seeing through in every disease. So we're going to deal with of that and hear from the FDA. Uh, we probably will, we're thinking about this, of taking the show on the road because we think it's really important for people to know about the unbelievable opportunities there are in science, but towards a goal, and that's towards helping patients. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you.